Hello everyone, thank you for joining us on this very cold Wednesday. Um, this is the second session of the suite of delivering GCSE Maths. So if you did not manage to see the first one, um, we'll give you a bit of direction throughout this on where to find that. But we're, we're going to continue these over the year. So the delivering GCSE Maths very much focused on supporting any schools that are new um, to, to Pearson and any schools that are new to delivering GCSE. But initially, the, the overall design, Mal, when we set out and planned these, was for any teachers that are not necessarily new to the profession, but new to examining year groups, uh, ready for their first GCSE sitting, or just refreshing and preparing yourself okay what is it what's out there what can we do what's the the bigger picture here on the preparing all the way up to uh, the gcse exams so this is number two which is the tools and resources um session that we're going to be running through today yeah so the idea behind these is that um we're not going to profess that it's you're instantly going to be able to go out there and correct, get grade nines out of all your students. It is because obviously it's that would take more than the time we've got. Um, and just to give you some hints and tips, and like all of these things, if you only take away one thing, one little golden nugget, it's worth doing. So the original session, say the original, the part one, the basics uh, that we ran through, and that was on the fourth of October. Um, called Everything You Need to Know, Part 1, The Basics. And you can find that recording um, in the PD Academy, I believe. Um, any problems finding that, just let us know. We'll pop up our email addresses and we'll, we'll direct you where to find, find that recording. Um, we're going to look at some go-to web pages, go-to support, uh, where some ideas are, where the resources are out there that we found useful on our journey over the last, I'm not going to say many years teaching. Um, and general help and advice and guidance that's out there uh, with a few little, I suppose, anecdotes thrown in along the way. We're, we're both practising teachers. We're both in the classroom, um, both actually in new jobs. So Mal started her new job in September this year and I started in January this year. So we're both in new jobs. We were working together for many, many years. Um, in several locations and we're on the next phase of our our journey through hopefully helping some uh, uh, more students get some good results. Um, some dates for your diaries. Um, obviously the, the whole of the suite of this package is, is set up into delivering GCSEs. Uh, the November exams have now finished. They were um, a couple of weeks ago and we're now working towards these dates here um, in May june um, may and june all am exams um, all in the morning and the first two so paper one and paper two are separated by the may half term um so you've got them all wrapped up maths wrapped up anyway by the 10th of june 24. Um, and we talk Sega spoke about anecdotes one of the anecdotes at that point to drop in is that we've always from september started a countdown days to your maths exam um, just a, a, on our whiteboard somewhere that never, so the days to your maths exam never get rubs off. And then every day we changed and had this count. And we've been doing that for a long, long time. And it's always stark when you get below 199 for some reason. And then this year I um, sent Seager a little present at his new school, which is a little electronic countdown clock. And you can actually buy digital countdowns. Um, and I treated myself to one. I've actually got that stuck to my board now. So I set it up, synchronized it to the start of the first maths exam. And so today it was 164, I think it was. Uh, don't don't quote me on 164. Um, so yes, so that's always is from the start of the year, we're always counting down towards those dates and then take a bit of a sigh of relief come the last date. The first time, if you do that and pop it up on your board or get one of these little countdowns and mine sat on the desk facing the students, it's not a stressful or anxiety trigger here. This is just a reminder. Now, the first time you do it, you'll get a couple of students going, oh, I hate that. I don't like that. But the, 
when it's there and the, the and they're used to it and they're seeing it and the reality of what a week does or what a half term does or what a Christmas break does in terms of those numbers, the year 10 are seeing it, the year nine are seeing it that are in your classrooms and all the other year groups. And they're used to that process of seeing actually time does go quick, but particularly that year 11 and the amount of, and I don't know if you've got the same, the amount of the year, year 10 students that are saying, I can't believe how quick that's gone down. And it's a reality for them in advance of them starting year 11. So I think it's a great conversation to have with all your students. And it's something I do with our year sevens and our previous school started with year nines. The introduction with me as a new teacher, okay, I did it a bit better when we came back in September rather than my January start, was how quick did year six go for you guys? How quick did year nine go for you guys? That conversation of putting a reality on it that that time does go by and what we're working towards here so uh always always up in the background yeah and it's also um I, quite often i refer to the number of seconds in an air, seconds in a minute the number of seconds in an hour so constantly reminding them three thousand six hundred eighty six thousand four hundred to the point where some of my year 11s will now know that there is eighty six thousand four hundred seconds in a day and that might seem minor, but there was a couple of questions that have come up where that was quite useful to know that. It was something to do with estimate the number of days and straight away they were able to go, oh, I'm just going to put down 90,000 because I know there's 80, and they'd written 86,400. Um, so sometimes some of this stuff that feels like nonsense and just me chuntering on does sink in with students. Right, we'll start with the Emporium. Um... Pearson's Emporium. Um, so in terms of where this is, Google Math Emporium, you will need a login to get in there, but you don't need to get that via your school or anyone else. You can request that yourself. Um, it is um, it is the amazing Emporium and where this is our go to um, on a daily basis as teachers. The amount that's in there and someone did make a comment last week on a support visit and I'll talk about support visits a little bit later on, but of it is a bit of a minefield in there, but once I directed them to click through GCSE mathematics and some of the go-tos that we're going to talk about here, it's it's only a minefield because there is so much in there, not that it's hard to find anything, very slick, very easy to organise. Um, and this is where we're going to start now with our uh, resource bank talking. There is literally, there is hours of your life that can be lost. You don't have to be a head of department to use it. Nobody ever told me that. I thought a lot of the resources that were from the exam boards, you had to be um, a HOD. And then lo and behold, actually, this is available to us as normal teachers. Um, some of it you will find, like the spec and the teacher guidance. You will only dip into those when there's a new qualification. Um, similarly with things like the specimen papers and the sample assessment materials. And again, don't stress about that as we, if we go through the next round of reform, you will find that all of a sudden you become very interested in that kind of terminology. Um, then we've got the mock papers. So Pearson produce an annual mock and have done, um, they've produced eight sets of mock papers. So these are secure mock papers. Um, so the latest one is only available on edXL online, which is there is padlocked, so to speak. So it's not uh, available for general consumption. Um, but then as soon as the next one comes out, the old ones get put on here. Then you've got your past papers, um, examiners reports and exemplars. The examiners reports become really useful once you've gone through an exam season because you will reflect on what you feel you taught well and actually what the students learned well rather than because a lot of the time we all I think that we we sometimes beat ourselves up about teaching students not grasping stuff and sometimes it's not to do with the teaching it's sometimes students aren't quite ready to learn um, but the examiner's report are really useful for hints and tips about what the, the national cohort did well and what they need to improve and constantly I'll say oh we did the that really well 
oh, that was rubbish, that question. And, we, and then you read the examiner's report. Actually, that performed poorly nationally. So I'm not going to beat myself up too much about it. But again, it, it's almost on my reading to list to sort of end of August. Um, then you've got on the next. I think at this point, Mal, it's it's a good point to actually mention becoming an, an examiner, um, and how useful it is, and what we've done throughout our career is is we we started it, we've dipped into it, gone back to it a year later, had a couple of years off, gone back to it again. Being an examiner and marking GCSE papers is second to none in terms of CPD. Reading an examiner's report is great. And it, like Mal says, it gives you a great flavour of what that series was like. What was the, the, the positives? What was the general negatives? And then you can look at individual questions and the feedback. But when you're in it and you are one of those markers and you see it firsthand, and that is part and parcel of that role that you've got as a, as a marker to get underneath the skin of the students and see what they're putting down on those on those exam questions, you cannot, I can't explain enough how good it is to bring that experience back to the classroom from your role as being an examiner. Um, and we, it's something that I can't recommend enough. Um, and if again, you can Google being an examiner and find out about that and, uh, and delve into that at your, whenever you want to as part of your own career, but heavily recommend that. Yeah, I did it in my NQT year, um, and it was enlightening because sometimes you think, I can't believe some students are not grasping this concept, and then you'll go and you'll mark that question on a national level, and you'll go, actually, our students aren't doing too badly. Sometimes it's a sense of comfort, um, but also from the CPD, and C has mentioned this, the CPD is phenomenal in terms of pedagogy, in terms of, I wonder why they've made that mistake or the common mistake I'm seeing with this question is this misconception. And it might be something that you, you've you never seen before, but once you've seen the same mistake a few times, you can then take that back to the classroom and say, look, this is a common mistake that students make. Um, and I think it did advance my practice a lot, being able to... Um, just talk from a point of expertise about what mistakes students make outside my own classroom. And Absolutely. I think that was the important thing. Mm. Um, then on the bottom row, we've got the historical grade boundaries and skills maps. Um, a note about the grade boundaries, and this is something that is that the grade boundaries are published on a suite of three papers. Um, and then within those that grade boundary document, you will sign find what are called notional grade boundaries for each paper. So it isn't really a case of okay. So if the grade boundary for a four was a hundred and fifty out of two forty, I can just split that by three and get a grade boundary because I might only be allocated by my SLT two at the time for two exam papers. Um. It isn't as simple as just dividing by three because the pa the difficulty within each paper might vary. So there are notional grade boundaries published. However, sometimes those notional grade boundaries don't necessarily add up to. So use that example I've just said about one fifty for a five for a four. You might find that one of the papers is fifty three, one is forty nine, and the other one is or whatever it comes out at that means that when you add up all three, it only adds up to 149. It's because they're meant to be notional grade boundaries for each paper. And because the grade boundary mechanism works on the total score for three papers, not, well, we're gonna grade each paper and then see what happens. Um, so just, just that's just a word of advice, really, because I did make the mistake of the f a couple of years in going, I've just added these up. This comes out as 134, and yet the grade boundary that was published is 135. We're owed some extra grade Cs in the old days. Um, so that's a bit of note about notional grade boundaries per paper. Um, question level analysis, that's what QLA stands for. Again, early days of teaching, there's so many... Um, 
acronyms and nobody ever bothers to explain them to you that sometimes you end up making your own phrase up for them. And I'd love to hear what the funniest phrase is you've come up with for an acronym. Um, shadow papers. So a shadow paper is a paper that looks like the original, tests exactly the same skills, might have the context of the story changed for a multi-step question, but the numbers have been changed. Because of the way students can, I don't know how they even find sometimes some of the, some of the lock papers. And also you want more practice, but practicing the same skills. So they are written in such a way that they test and examine exactly the same skills as the live paper did, but with a different set of numbers. The idea being that you can then use the same grade boundaries. Um, and we've, over the years, we've tried all sorts of different combinations when it comes to mocks, things like we might give them the real paper one, the non-calculator. Then if students have managed to find that paper, um, they then go, oh, they're going to give me paper two. So we give them paper three as paper two. Um, and then because they've then seen two of the three, the odds are that they're going to sus that you swap paper three for paper two and then find the solutions for the, the paper two. Um, and we've then used the shadow paper for paper three, which has thrown some students. Um, some schools choose to use three shadow papers. Some choose to use those shadow papers post a mock because it gives you the opportunity to red pen, green pen, purple pen, whatever color pen, when you review the your mocks with students, but then say, okay, we've gone through it. Now here's another paper to have a go at that tests exactly the same skills. So that's what a shadow paper is. Um, practice papers, these have been produced since 2017. The idea being that it's more practice based on the makeup of the new GCSE, I still call it the new GCSE, um, in terms of assessment objectives. So they, they supposedly got the same amount of, um, same proportion of AO1, AO2, AO3, same proportion of number, algebra, ratio and proportion um, as per a live sitting, but based on questions from um, other areas of the maths assessment so some of them use past questions from pre-2017 some are made up from questions from the IGCSE um, so they're quite difficult to grade but definitely worth a look at if you're looking for more practice um, and Sega's got likes to talk about the use of the practice papers how far back would you now go Sega because it's 20 odd of them yeah, so twenty four is the is the one at the moment that we've, I think the the limits we've got to twenty four. So we go back and I dip into them and actually I email parents um, on a weekly basis and just update them with a OneDrive folder where I'm dropping these papers in on a weekly basis, um, working backwards from twenty four. Um, so by the time you've done that over the course of year eleven, you've got back. Um, or, or even whatever year group you want to be doing this with, you're not going back to the early ones. <clears throat> Practice at one, two, three, four, and to be fair, probably the, the, the first 10, 12 papers, I would say, are more designed around what the GCSE looked like when it landed in 2017. So my advice is work backwards from that set on whatever you, you, you're using there. Uh, and but then they are you should a good build set. And then you should build up enough confidence in the students that they they're prepared enough, having seen enough papers, to um, not be put off by how tough some of the questions are or the the ramping is. Um, so definitely worth looking at if you're looking for extra exam practice. Um, teaching and learning materials. There's some lovely stuff in there. There's some specific stuff for post sixteen in terms of theme papers. Um, and a booster, a whole load of other resources. Um, and then we've, there's a professional development folder. So we're going to have a little delve. There's obviously then folders for stats. There's folders for A-level. Um, 
I just got entry level, the new EMC that's coming, which is the new level two qual. Um, and we'll have a look at and talk around a couple of these. Yeah, I think we've run through most of those bullet points there. And then a couple of the big ones that are in that list, but also going back to when Mal talked us through those folders, um, the kind of things we can find. So you've got the one marker starters, which are brilliant set of starters, which has got all the one mark questions from the foundation papers from 2017 up to last summer. So they need to be updated um, with the last couple. But in terms of the 16 starters there that can be used, I've found those really useful with my year nine students. Having my year nines fluid, and it's all key stage three maths, key stage two maths. It's all that kind of stuff that you want them comfortable with to help them prepare for year 10 and 11, their GCSE, and seeing them in the kind of word format that can appear as a one mark question. So those one marker starters are brilliant. We yes, do so don't, don't limit yourself to just thinking, oh, it's exam it's stuff for year 11 um and this is the prime example where it can be useful for lower year groups so there was something started back in 2017 where um the maths team at the time looked to break down an exam paper into three different tiers so your bronze your silver your gold where your gold is the paper as it was um and then your bronze was proper taking down those multi-step questions and scaffolding them in such a way that a format question may have been broken down into four, a part A, part B, part C. So it might be work out the, the total number of tins of cat food that somebody needs to buy. Work out the number of days in four weeks. And for each of those um multi-step questions just to show students that actually they can access them if they because the biggest challenge one of the biggest challenges apart from tiering is um method selection for students when for, in an exam is that and we all know this as teachers that i could teach so today i've taught year 11 pythagoras um and yes that they might be able to recall tomorrow if i'm lucky how to do the process, how to choose whether it's the longest side, the shorter side. But when they're faced with the 29 questions, they almost have to, need to have this massive decision tree about what's the topic, what's the method, and choosing, um, oh, it's a Pythagoras question, without it being in a lesson where I've just taught them Pythagoras. Um, so if, but if we can break it down, sometimes... The topic reveals itself once you've made a start to a question that some students just don't have the resilience for yet, but they will have. Um, so these bronze, silver, gold, like I say, the bronze is with lots of scaffolding. The silver is with some scaffolding. I've used these um, where I've found certain questions especially when I've taken a group through from year nine into 10, where I know that they, or I know I'm going to take them into year, from nine into 10 or even 10 into 11, where I might teach a topic in year nine and give them the bronze version today. And then I'll make a note and print it off and stick it in my folder for those students. And then next year I might give them, and I know it sounds like a lot of uh, planning, but next year, I might think, actually, I know I've taught Pythagoras this year, uh, last year. So here is the silver version of that question or the gold version of that question. Yes, it's the same question and yes, it's the same answer, but there will be a long period of time between. But for students to then see that, actually, I did it last year. What's the difference? Oh, it's just not broken down. Um, so definitely worth a look at. I'd almost think there is an argument that in some settings, the first time you give a student um, papers, that one of the options could be to give them the, the bronze version where they got some scaffolding. Um, or mm -hmm. the other option is the reordered papers. <clears throat> 
Yeah, we've got the reordered papers in terms of challenge. And they, th what they've been designed around is what the, uh, the feedback and the outcomes that come from the sitting. So if they question, I don't know, one part B has been answered really badly by most of the cohort or a big percentage of the cohort, looking at the success of it, that goes towards the end of the reordered paper. So the success of how well the, the students did nationally orders the paper. Now that what that does, it does put common misconceptions towards the back if, if it does show up. For example, we had back in 2017, 2018, M cubed add M cubed. The misconception was to add the powers, making M to the power of six and not write two M cubed. It was a badly answered question. So that would go towards the end of the paper. Um, so as, as, as much as they are great, and I think me and Mal agree on this, that we wouldn't ever give those papers to year 11 because you need them to see and feel the ups and downs. Mm. That does not allow for that. And it almost is a false sense of security how it would feel. But yeah. they are great for those first time dipping into showing students exam papers of actually this was in order and tell the students as well. These are in order of the success that the students felt. Yeah, and I think that, again, the first time choosing uh, and as some of you will out, out there will be early in your career and as you progress, choosing the first time students see an exa a full exam paper is quite a big decision. Um, and sometimes you giving them a full paper where it's the first time they see it, it can be quite daunting for some students. Whereas if you've got a paper that has been reordered in order of difficulty, they shouldn't get to the point because they need to be quite emotionally intelligent, uh, mature, where they get past, they get to a question because a lot of students, the first time they see it, will get to a question and think that everything after that point isn't for them. So those reordered papers are great for, well, no, they're in the order of difficulty. And yes, there will be tough questions, but it genuinely does get tougher. There isn't the unexpected up and down that we get with the live sitting where a question will, for some reason, unexpectedly not perform as well as it should or may perform better than it we thought it would yeah uh, we've got the adapted papers that have got the context stripped out a little bit i wouldn't say to the extreme of it gone completely but papers where the context can hold students up um, or they can't see the maths through the context so it's been stripped back and you can build those in gradually over the course of the GCSE course or the tail end of your key stage three course to show them these kind of questions in preparation for when the context does appear. We've got so, the themed fitness. Sorry, Mark. Give, give an example of what the context free would look like. Are you talking about something like, um, I don't know, the houses and bungalows question? Yeah, um, got that. that it, it doesn't open itself perfectly to every type of question. So you can't just strip out the context of some questions without the maths completely disappearing. But if you've got a, a whole story about houses, bungalows, um, fraction of an amount, percentages, if you take out the, the question about, or, or, the, or the, the theme around it, which is how many houses, how many bungalows, and we're talking about houses and bungalows because there was a question that appeared like this, and just going straight for what is three quarters of 800? What is 20% of? Um, and then you can show in hand in hand, actually, this question appears, that maths that you can understand and you have done. And on the front covers, they actually say which questions they are that have had the context adapted or stripped out. You can show then, and within that paper is still the question with the context, so it will have two question sevens, two question tens, two question elevens, and they can see, actually, I can do that maths, and now I can apply it with that question with the houses and bungalows that I've just been able to do as a percentage and a fraction of amount question. Hopefully and I that think that's a, I think that's a really powerful thing, because a lot of the time, if you give students, I don't know with my starters, where I'm giving them uh, my bread and butter starters, the last question always looks tough and it's it never is it's just there's lots of words and, and giving them strategies how to tackle the words um and i just keep saying look you can do the sums what we need to do is find the sums within the words yeah uh theme papers 
which is basically a selection of papers around a certain theme, for example, recipes, um, and then some of those higher end topics as well. So um, expanding bracket, triple brackets, um, or some of those topic areas where you want to have a go to just a selection of those questions. And Mal's already talked about the shadow papers as well. Now, this one is our current favorite at the moment, the aiming for papers whether you go for the aiming for grade one, grade two, grade three, grade four, it's the, the big thing here is what you can have a conversation. And, and these are brilliant for my tutor time maths at school. So we have maths in tutor time with intervention year 11 groups. And I've given them the, if they are our top performing students, they're aiming for a grade three paper, which essentially covers the, the maths that builds up to that grade four. But what you can give them, and it says suggested grade boundaries at the end of the mark scheme, but it's realistically, it's a mark that you're going to give to the students and say, on average, a grade four student got 19 out of, I don't know how many marks it was out of that particular mm -hmm. paper, but out of the 25 marks available for those selection of questions. Or an average grade five student got 24. And it's just really great conversations that you can have before setting that paper with the students and saying right well, and it was actually Mal's idea she said when she gave this out to a group that we shared she said right a grade five student on average with these selection of questions and I don't know it wasn't this paper it was one of the others got 31 marks and it was out of 32 this selection mm -hmm. of questions um you, you're allowed to drop one mark go and find that one mark now before answering a question that you're going to allow yourself to drop and just nice little conversations about what kind of benchmarks to head to uh, um, with certain ilk of questions um really interesting really powerful i think sharing yeah. that with students. and so these are put together based on the 2022 papers up summer and august summer and autumn and they've taken all of the um so everything in foundation paper one, looked at the mean score, ordered it, and then based on, so like the aiming for grade one was the um, first 30 marks that the the average grade one student performed best at. Um, and that was our aiming for grade one papers. And then aiming for grade two were the next 30 marks. And we thought it was thought that it was 30 marks because when you're looking at the lower ends, giving them 60 marks is a lot of marks for a, a grade one or grade two student ordered by grade two to performance, taking out the questions that had already appeared on the aiming for grade one and so on as you go up the grades with an idea that grade boundaries could then be set. So if you look at the... Um, suggested grade one boundary there of a five, that's halfway between a U and a one, because you would imagine the grade boundaries could be between a U and a one for the grade boundary for a grade one student to, cause to then span from halfway between the U and the one up to halfway between the one and the two. Um, and they're available for all of them. I've actually started using a similar version for... Um, right from grade one with a year nine set one once a week we're now on week three so i'm now on aiming for grade three they are and i said to them it's 31 um marks a you if you're looking at a grade five and i said and i had to apologize that i'm capping them at a grade five and then today was the next one and they were all coming in going are we doing that thing that grade thing we do and it's become our thing our weekly thing with it and one of them come up to me and said I forgot I lost a mark and again it's context um and for these students doing it back in year nine as a um a little bit of an extra weekly exercise especially starting down at grade one because and the way I explain to them is I don't want to teach you high flyers pictograms However, if I don't, if they don't see it at some point, it could be three or four years. And I know pictograms is unlikely to turn up on a higher tier, but some, not all of those students for life, because the things go on in their lives, one or two may end up doing foundation. Um, and I feel like would fail if they end up sat in a paper that they hadn't seen the content for. So um, 
which is why I'm doing it back in year nine. And they're absolutely lapping it up. But the context was today was something to do with a deposit. And one of the girls, she went, I've just lost all the marks on that because I added the deposit, not realising that a deposit was taken off what was owed. And it was to do with how she had her understanding of what a deposit meant. So really useful for picking up things like that. So I think they're, they're my favourite at the minute. Oh, great. Um, we're going to quickly run through a few other things. So the Emporium is the is the go-to. Um, an absolute genius bank of resources, but knowing what you're looking for, and that was a, a very quick glance over some of the big things that we're using at the moment. The Exam Wizard system is a essentially an exam paper creator from all of the previous exams, whether it's actually GCSE, nine to one, the old GCSE questions or IGCSE papers. And you can create exam papers, mini assessments, just a selection of questions for students um, and in, in a nice, simple, easy way. Um, and you can actually preview them, see them before putting them into a, a mini paper and then get them downloaded with mark schemes and examiner's reports, going back to what we talked about earlier, whether you choose to have the mark scheme or examiner's report as part of it, it's up to you. Um, and then you can put those in, in Word and edit them and make them look how you want to. So that a great piece of kit. Um, and that one you will need to get through um, the edXL online password now, um, which you may need to see your examiner, um, your exams you know, officer, exams officer to set you up with one, which isn't a problem. It's very, very quick and easy. Um, and they will set you up behind the scenes to get get you into that system there. And there's actually on there, there's some new, when you go into the search bar, there's some new qualifications that have just appeared this week. So things like I primary or I second or lower secondary. Um, so there's a, a lot more questions that are slowly being added to it as a resource. Um, and it, it doesn't matter what topic you're looking for, but don't limit your search to just the nine to one GCSE. Widen your search and go, actually, I'm I'm doing I'm doing scatter graphs. Just limiting your search to the nine to one GCSE will only bring up questions that have been examined in the last um since 2017. Whereas if you look at, I don't know, the stat GCSE stats, you'll get some yes, they might involve some areas that we don't examine at GCSE. But why not expose students to it or go and have a look at the IGCSE or if you're doing algebra, go and have a look at the Edexcel Awards algebra um, as the qualification. Even for your high flyers, go and have a look at some of the A-level questions, not necessarily for the current spec, but for previous specs, because you might find, actually, that's a really nice question. I'm going to use that. So don't okay. just limit it. In the um, back back to Emporium, I think there's some of the old O level papers there, so you can go back and have a look at some real old maths, but not on Exam Wizard. Um, yeah, some is. some go tos in terms of places where you will dip into throughout your period of time teaching um, maths, whether it's early in your career or even a little bit later on. Uh, Tes, you do need an account to sign up to Tes. Um, loads of resources in there. Um, that is a minefield. Resourceaholic, which is Joe Morgan, some great resources and, and pointing direction to some brilliant resources. Corbett Maths seems to come up always when you search a certain topic. Um, and of course, the, the fantastic, amazing Just Maths web page, which is also a great go to in terms of where to look for things, blogs. Um, and Mal does, I'm, obviously, I'm, I'm bigging up Just Maths because that is myself and Mal, but read some of Mal's blogs go back and read the story of the journey of us going through um, our, our time as teachers and not just the math side of it, but also the ups, downs and I suppose the the everything else that wraps around um, as part of the job. Yeah. BBC Bite Size, there's some great yeah. stuff on there. There's the Bite Size and it, it is one of those ones that you start off, and I remember using it loads back when I started my, my maths teaching, and then, I don't know what it is, just gradually opened up to, you've only got so much time with all these different resources out there, but I found myself going back to it recently, and it is amazing. It's 
bite size is brilliant. They they really have put a lot of cash behind that to get it fully sweeted up with all the different exam boards, different levels of maths. And I'm going back here to key, some of the key stage three, key stage two stuff is, is excellent on bite size. So really do go back and have a look at bite size. Now I've put this on here because again, it was making me think what, what is it? We've got our go to our resource pages, our websites, but actually there's some brilliant videos out there as well that are, I wouldn't ever do this all the time, put a video on, here we go again, but utilize the power of what is out there in terms of videos and YouTube. And it was only last week that we were teaching capture recapture to our year 11 students, uh, a higher tier topic. And someone at work said, oh, I didn't even know about this. Have you seen the Johnny Ball uh, black cabs in London capture recapture video? And I hadn't, it's just a short five, seven minute, well, in fact, it's there. Five minute, 14 second video of Johnny Ball using capture recapture in real life, uh, trying to estimate how many black cabs there are in the whole of London. It was brilliant, brilliant video to, to introduce and talk about um, how many, a real life scenario. And then this gem, and I can't believe that I still use it. And I can't believe that I've walked around so many schools and even the science department in every school I've been in utilized this video and it was made way before most of the teaching staff were born let alone um the students were born but it's a brilliant video to take you through you notice the... how he says most of the teaching staff and I know he'd be he'd be giving me the side eye at that point <laughs> well I'm thinking how many young teachers there are in in the school I'm at at the moment and if I said 1977 they'd go what yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's brilliant. And then some of the songs that we play and we don't even think about it. We just go to it, play it. Me and Mal play these two at the bottom all the time. But to say, do I recommend it and talk to other teachers about it? No, because it's just part and parcel. We we get to circumference an area of a circle. Here we go again. We play this, but we forget to tell other teachers about this and remind them it's there until they whinge that the noise coming from our classroom um, and then the pop goes the weasel song for area of the trapezium. So the power of it, obviously watch it first before committing it to putting it up on the screen. Yeah. Um, but yeah, some great go-to videos. And it, then it got me thinking, these as well, our, our Chris Moyles starter questions, they were brilliant. They used to be in one place on Sheffield Maths, didn't they? A web page, but that, that went. And you can actually still find them if you just Google them. Um, just Chris Moyle's Math Starters, a couple of minutes, a question where some famous bands are singing a song, but they've changed their lyrics to math questions. Um, and you press pause and then play the answer. Brilliant. Um, and it made me get on back onto that this week um, or the end of last week when I was starting to put this presentation together for today or finalise it, thinking, oh, what about these videos? Brilliant stuff. What was really nice is going back to my early days when I was still um, really keen into trying new things. I did it with a year nine group as a, a summer activity where they had to write their own song. Um, and it was my last year at Trinity Seeger with the, uh, yeah. year, the year group there. And they, they did an amazing job. I filmed them as they performed their um their version of this and it was just a lovely thing to look back on and say oh that was for those students it was a, and it was a really nice memory because we forget that school attending school is about forming memories rather than just shoving a load of maths facts at them sometimes which is what it feels like at certain points the crunch points of the year we year 11 um so definitely worth doing um some great locations to get, I say some, there's two on here, but the Pearson webpage has got some brilliant posters to put around the classroom. And I don't mean just your formula sheets or your decimal percentage posters that they've got, but there's a whole suite of um, famous mathematicians through history um, some with a, a statement at the bottom who they are and what they did. And I've got those printed A3 colour around my classroom, some brilliant posters, just liven up the maths classroom, um, and they are from Pearson. But then we've also got um, the, and again, you, you've probably seen these around your departments or classrooms, 
or schools or even uh, training venues. When will I ever need maths? Brilliant set of posters going through loads of different careers and where maths is needed for those careers. And when I was refreshing my mind where to get these from, which is mathscareers.org.uk, you can see the, um, the direction at the top where to look for those. There's a whole suite of other ones on there. Um, so when will I ever need, or what is the point of trigonometry? What is the point of a brilliant set of posters to have around your classroom, not just, um, like I've said before, your formula sheets, or it's, obviously it's great to have kids work up there, but having them interleaved with kids' work of where will I ever need this, where what's the point of this, and then some famous mathematicians in the mix as well really helps liven up your um, up your walls. Yeah, those posts. Yeah, those posters, they're a sign of a good poster because they've been around a few years now, but I see them in, in almost every maths department. But um, And they do, students do look at them, whether it's subliminally or consciously, um, definitely worth looking at. And then another go-to, don't forget Pearson's um, Guide to Their Assessments, which is a document put together, which is more about... Um, whether you're new to the GCSE or you're just refreshing or you're switching from another board, a guide, an overall guide to the assessments. Mm. Pearson's got credible specialists. Uh, there is the mugshot of myself and Mal um, a few hair. years ago. Now. Yeah, a few years <laughs> ago now. But we're there. We, we are support from Pearson, whether we come out to you guys, come to us online, email. We are available from Pearson as teachers in the classroom. Now, there's a couple of things here that we we literally going to glance over. We're not going to talk in depth about these two sections here because it is something we, we've we got um, on the PD Academy so you can go into a bit more depth. But it's just to put on your radar what is available and and think about it over the course of this year, ready for the end of this year, um, going into the next academic year. And the first one is Script Viewer. Pearson has got... Uh, script viewer, Google script viewer. Again, you will need a login from your exam officer, the same one that will get you into the whole suite of Edexcel online. Um, and script viewer essentially enables you to find the scripts of the students that sat that sitting in your centre. So whether it's just after the November papers, so this will go live in January for the November papers. Um, no, it won't. It's live now for the November papers. Um, and then it goes live after the summer papers and they obviously have to click over at some point. So the exam, the exact window I'm unsure of, I think it's sometime in the new year that the November sitting will go to allow way for the, the, the summer ones when they're ready to go in in August. Basically, there's a, there's a cycle that goes around and the, the papers, you can follow the clicks through and this is what you get to. You get to see the scripts of the students in your school, whether you're new to the school or you are looking at your first exam sitting or you are 10 years into the teaching and looking at your scripts. Look at those scripts from your students. Look at common misconceptions. See what your students are coming out with. Go back. And what I found really interesting, new to the school in January. So I knew the year 11 by a couple of months. But going in and having a look at their scripts, and I, I bet you Mal has done this in her school that she started in September, gone back and looked at the students from before she started. Am I right? Of course not. Hundred <laughs> percent. She's gone back in and had a look at, and it is a great, a great thing to do. And the, the feel of you, you get the feel of the students in your school, whether you're new or old to that school, you will get the feel of those students of what they are like, um, general patterns, rule of thumb, flicking through, oh, they, these students don't seem to leave much working out. These students seem to be leaving loads of working out. They've got a brilliant method of cutting the page in half. That kind of feel um, as a new, inexperienced, experienced teacher, script viewer is amazing. But again, yeah. we've got a whole session on this at another point. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's um, it's definitely worth just having on your radar to make sure that you you've got access to it because it's going to be a conversation with your exams officer as to whether or not you need it. And the argument is yes, you do. 
Absolutely. We all know you want it. Um, you so find, just be find things that have gone well, gone wrong, helps you with remarks or appeals or whatever it happens to be. Uh, and, and questions come out in the mix, in the conversations between departments, between teachers, between schools, in maths, between um, national events like this, where you can actually find um, intriguing and interesting conversations. But I'll flick over those slides and let you have a look at those at your own will. Um, Results Plus, another fantastic uh, bit of software, again, through edXR Online. Um, and it enables you to go in and really analyze what your students and you can set them up as classes behind the scenes as well, or just the students in your school have um, not succeeded, have, have done in comparison to the national averages for the students that have sat the edXL papers. And we, we love looking back at this because it gives us a, an idea of the questions that we did well on as a, as a school, as a cohort but also questions that we didn't do so well on, whether it's higher paper one, foundation paper two, um, certain maths areas that we're looking for, and going back and analysing that as a department, but an individual class teacher looking at what, what has done well with my groups is second to none. And then you can marry that up with script viewer as well and see um, certain kids' student uh, scripts on these questions that you've really wanted to look at, whether it's the top 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, or worst 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5 questions that has appeared on that summer or that November's papers, but a brilliant bit of kit. Again, yeah. we're going to we're going to over that quite quick. Yeah, and on that, you see the arrow there pointing at the edXL average. It will depend on where you are in your school's journey. So because of the kind of schools we've worked in, and this is the, the, the last school we're at, you can see we choose we chose to do our analysis based on the edXL average because at the end of the day, that was what we were, com were competing with every other cohort or every other student within the cohort. And so we were interested in how we performed against the edXL average. Some of you may be in the position where you're in a school where you're all, the, the results are, are maintainable, they're easily maintainable, and then you're talking about tweaking your percentages. So you might want to change that to the absolute values. Because you just want everybody to get 100%. Then go and have a look at the scripts that you're talking about on those. Uh, um, That's an intro. Go back to that there. one. The foundation students and the higher students. Yeah, so I pulled out there from our students one, the exact same question that was on the foundation paper, higher paper. In fact, it was, it was in, I wanted to find out what was doing, obviously, from Results Plus, it tells me what is being done well and what is not being done so well. But then you can compare the same questions that are in the crossover for the higher yeah. and the foundation. And I wanted to know what it was about this particular question. Well, we had we taught it so well. Yeah. And that was a group that myself and Mal taught that topic to. We had, we had the whole foundation compared to that same question not being performed very well when it was on the higher tier. And that's great CPD for our department, for us as individuals. But really, what is it that is it, is it just missed off? Do we focus not enough on that area uh, when it comes to the revision after school sessions? Is it is it not looked at in that last period? I don't know. It, it was more me wanting to find out because it came up on results plus that we were doing well on the foundation we tier on that question. But not Absolutely smashed it. Um, now, I've put this here to finish off with, because we, we are approaching the end. Um, some questions to ask yourself revol revolving around equipment and what the students experience of, of classroom environments, exams, internal assessments, compared to our perception of what happens during a test. It's not just an hour where the kids are silent and you have got a bit of an hour to catch up on some marking. It's it's also a period of time when they're going through something that you have minimal control over. Um, what's going through their head? What are they thinking? What are they doing? But what are they using? So what calculator do they own? Do they use? Do they use in class? Do they use it in school in general, in science, in the exam hall when they're out of your sight? Do they use the same model? Because that's huge. A student came to me this week 
um, a year 10 student and said, I really don't like my calculator. Can I have one for the exam or use one in the exam? And I said, actually, when you're in the exam, and this is a year 10 student who hasn't experienced exams in the hall yet, I had that conversation. Actually, the ones we use in class are this model and the ones that we use in the exams are exactly the same. We've got them in the packs in the hall. You can have your one as a backup or just to utilize at home, but I would advise you using this one. And it was interesting what Mal and I have been having an email conversation today about. Mal's put together this poster for a department or an email to go home with a wish list Christmas gift with what calculator, what protractor, what ruler to buy. And it was just interesting that that came up today um, on the back of uh, this conversation. filler ideas that our students will be chuffed, chuffed to bits to receive. Brilliant. But it's interesting about the calculator. I had a year 11 student that's just to this one, and it was yesterday's lesson. Um, he said, I don't know how to change. I don't know how to use this. My calculator's broken. And it is one of the new Casio ones where you have to press the format button um, to change it for to decimal. And it's obviously, it is not something I've ever seen before because I haven't used one because so, I'm used, still using... And it, I call it old. It's not. It's still a relatively new one, but it works like the old FX eighty fives. Yet the new one that he's got, the nine nine one, I think it is, or whatever one he's got, um, he's got this format button that I've never used it before. Mm, we're used and to if... saying S to D, aren't we? That S yeah. to D. Um... What protractors do they use or prefer? Or have they seen full circle, half circle? Have they had the choice? Um, we've got a set of both in our school, so I give them the choice. And it's amazing. As soon as you give them the choice of a nice small full circle, and I don't mean the big, huge ones you can get, compared to a half one, full circle wins every time. Mm. They're just a bit harder to get a hold of um, out and about there and a bit more expensive as well, but they are easier to use. But I'm not saying that's a direction to go in. I'm just saying it's a conversation to have with the students. The whole 30 centimetres versus 15 centimetre ruler, are they transparent? Are they white and see-through? It's it's a lot easier to draw a line of best fit with a transparent ruler. Um, does it have millimetres on their ruler that they're using or are they just centimetres? All these kind of things to think about when you are talking to a student or preparing them for internal assessments or even just that topic that needs that bit of equipment. Can they use a pair of compasses? Do they know that in general, the black bit at the top on that one on the right hand side is the only bit they're supposed to touch once that pencil is loaded? They're not supposed to touch the metal parts. It's only supposed to be the black parts. Um, those kind of conversations. And then here we go again. I didn't think we were going to have this conversation. This was a last minute addition this week. Are they trained on how to use formula sheets, the year 11s we are talking about now? Because it looks like consultation dependent, obviously, that they are back again for 2024 summer exam papers. So and it's November. Not, just, and November. We cannot throw them in front of students without them being prepared. And I know Mal's got a brilliant um, PowerPoint which I'm sure she'll share if uh, you get in touch and it's something relevant for you that is a, a tick or trash presentation. Are these things useful for you? Um, because I know that the way Sokotoas crops up on there is not the way we teach it in class. So we've said, actually, you, you want to rely on your memory rather than what's on your formula sheet here. Um, and the probability wording on there as well, I find very, very difficult on that formula sheet. But exam aid, sorry, it's called an exam aid. So, Final part there from us is just a matter so, of thinking about what's in front of them. So um, somebody's just asked about whether or not students are going to get an exam aid. It was just announced 10 days, less than 10 days ago, um, I think. A bit more, maybe, I don't know, last couple of weeks that Ofqual had been instructed by the DfE to go to consultation about introducing the formula sheet for summer 24 and November 24. And essentially... It's, if we've gone to consultation, it is likely that there will be a formula sheet um, available. It will be exactly the same formula sheet, I suspect, given the time, leading time we've got. And the formula sheet has to be the same from all the exam boards. Um, because 
otherwise you don't want to advantage one over the others, which is why they all have the same formula on. And we're unlikely to get consensus in such a short leading time. Um, if you want a copy of that tick or trash, I think it might may already be on my blog somewhere. Or if not, just drop me an email. And I think Sega's got the email address at the end. And I will right. share. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Um, and I'll send it to you um, later on in the week when I've got an admin time. An admin half hour. Please, yeah. please do keep in touch um, with this. This is number two of the suite. Um, and then we'll be back um, the exact date. I can't think when it is. I've got it on my big planner where our number three of these is. Um, and I started. Like yeah. And I started this by saying if there was only one golden nugget that you got from that, it was worth giving up the time. Um, in terms of calculators, if you look at the. Um, JCQ websites, there is a document that details which calculators can and can't be used. Um, and the exams, I don't know what a Casio CG50 does exactly, um, but there is, and the exams officer will be able to give you the current up-to-date guidance. So I don't want to say anything um, about what can and can't be used. I would direct people um to their exams officer about which specific ones because if it does change um they'll be able to give you the most up-to-date guidance on that but it is a it's a whole minefield because calculators are constantly changing it um as, a, as to a list of calculators because they change so much i think some of the exam boards do publish a list but it's so fluid the best point because most of the um what they made what's the word producers of these calculators will be able to tell you whether or not they're allowed or not um but i would still go back to my exams office and say look they've got this calculator can i can we use it um and i'd certainly do that before i went out and bought anything on bulk if I was looking at departmental calculators. Real? Well, there we go. With three minutes over, that's not too bad, considering myself and Mal do have a habit of going off a little bit. But please do get in touch. And uh, thank you very much for listening. And we'll be back for the third one in January. Bye.